Okay, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, it, that looked like a lot of fun. Um, some of the questions looked a bit terrifying to me, so I'm glad I wasn't doing the learning pad tonight, but um, I hope you all had a great time with it. Anyway, so in the next 20 minutes or so, um, before we announce the results, I'm gonna talk about something related to some of the research that I do. And um, what I'm gonna tell you about is how to train a GAN. Um, so first of all, I'll tell you what that is, then I'll tell you how to train it, and then I'll show you what you can do once you know how to train it. So let's get started. So there won't be too many, there'll be a few equations in my talk, but not too many. But I wanna start off with this picture here. Um, let's just step back for a moment and. I don't know if anybody recognizes the artist of this. Maybe it looks dis distinctive of a particular time, or maybe you notice it from a particular time period, or maybe there's something else in it that you can notice. But let's just hold those thoughts for a moment and we'll, we'll come back to it in a minute. Maybe you'd also like to think about how much money you think it's, it's worth. Okay, so first of all, the first part of my talk, um, I'm gonna tell you what a gun is and what they do. So, uh, GAN is short for Generative Adversarial Network. Um, what they do is they are an approach to fitting a so-called generative model um, over a complex structured space. So what that means is it's a black box, if you like, that you push a button on and then out comes, it generates a sample from one of these spaces. And complex doesn't mean complex numbers here. It means uh, complex in the sense of it's, a very complex object. It has lots of complexities and that sort of thing. So for example, images are complex, videos are complex, molecules are complex and, and, and stuff like that. But we'll mainly focus on images today. Um, once you've trained one of them, what you can do is you can get it to generate samples from that space. So if you trained a gun to generate portrait paintings, then you could take one sample of it and it might look a little bit like this picture here, which is the same one we saw on the previous slide. Um, let me just go back actually one. Notice also in the bottom right there, there's a some sort of equation in the bottom there. Uh, that's relevant and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, this particular artwork, it's constructed using one of these garns. Um, it's made by a Paris-based arts collective called Obvious. Um, and what they did was they trained it on by looking at 15,000 reference portraits from various time periods. Um, it's called Edmond de Bellamy, and it actually sold in 2018 for about half a million US dollars. Um, so this was completely generated by a computer. Okay, here's another example I wanna show you. Um, maybe some of these people look familiar to you. There are some celebrities that you may know. I'll just give you a minute to, um, to think about that. These pictures are also actually, um, completely generated by a computer. So none of these are real people. These are all images of people that have been generated by a GAN that's called Style GAN 2, which is made by um, researchers from NVIDIA, the, the company that makes graphics cards. And um, if you have already found my talk boring and you just want to look at something else, you can go to this web page, thispersondoesnotexist.com, and you can just push refresh. And each time you push refresh, you'll get a new picture of a person like this that doesn't exist. So these people, not real people at all. Okay, um, and the list goes on, right? So um, here's a website that is kind of a matrix of all these sorts of guns. This X does not exist and you can have a look at what's there. So this cat does not exist. Of course, we're on the internet, so cats come up. Um, you can also see some other ones there. So this rental does not exist is there as well. Uh, mean, okay, we're on the internet again. So this mean does not exist. Again, it can just generate means by refreshing the page. It gets weirder. Uh, this foot does not exist. Um, and there's one more that I thought I'd just look in a little bit closer and it's these lyrics do not exist. Um, and so since this is a mathematics event, I thought I would have a go at that. And I selected um, an EDM track. I said it should have a happy mood and I got it to generate some lyrics about the theme mathematics. And I got this uh, little gem here. So um, yeah, as you can see the chorus, mathematics, your garden, mathematics, your garden. You can mathematics all day and you can work online. Um, I think you can get bonus points in this Olympiad if, if you put these lyrics to, to music and, and make a recording and send it to us. So um, yeah, 
That's my challenge. Okay, let's let's talk about what these actually are. That's what they can do, but what are they actually? So, um, in short, a GAN frame this problem of generating samples in some space as a competition between two neural networks. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, a neural network is just a box that you put some stuff into and it gives you out something and it has some settings or parameters inside. And so this picture down the bottom shows you roughly how it works. So you have two neural networks. The generator is a neural network and the discriminator is a neural network. The generator's job is to take random noises input. So that's what it's showing down the bottom there. And then it outputs a picture of something. So it tries to make a picture. Um, the discriminator gets a picture as input, either from a real picture or a fake picture. And it has to just say, the picture you gave me is either real or fake. And so the way, these, the way a gun works is the generator and the discriminator are competing against each other. They're trying to fool each other. And if they're trained together at the right way, they can make each other stronger. Okay, so you kind of end up with these two neural networks having a competition and the way they, they, train, each, they train each other essentially if you do it correctly. Um, but if you don't do it correctly, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, one of those things is called mode collapse. Um, and so what happens there is if you don't train the generator and discriminator, discriminator evenly, um, what happens is one gets too strong and the other one kind of just gives up. So um, that's essentially what I'm saying here. And you can think of this a bit like if I played a game of tennis against Ash Barty, um, Ash Barty might be serving and she might realize my backhand is pretty weak. And so every single uh, point, she serves the ball to my backhand and wins the point. And then I just give up, I don't get any better and she wins every single point. Whereas if I was learning against someone who was more evenly matched with me, I might get it back sometime and then slowly my backhand would improve. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the sort of problems we can have there. Okay. So mathematically, what's the problem look like? Um, mathematically, this is a, a min-max problem. Uh, so it's an optimization problem where you're trying to minimize over one variable while simultaneously maximizing over another variable. And what these things represent in this problem are the following. So the generator has a set of internal parameters that um, determines how it converts the random noise into an image. And those parameters are represented by a vector x. Um, the discriminator has some internal parameters which determines how it decides whether a picture is real or fake. And that gives you the uh, vector y. And then the thing that you're trying to min max over, it's this function phi, which depends on both of these internal parameters. And it's the accuracy of the discriminator um, predicting a particular, the accuracy of, of this for a given combination of internal parameters in those two things. So the discriminator is trying to increase its prediction accuracy, right? which is why it's a maximization for the discriminator. Whereas the generator is trying to fool the discriminator, which means it wants to decrease the discriminator's prediction accuracy, which is why it's trying to minimize over X. So there's these two competing things. And um, in practice, we have X, when we want to solve this for these, uh, these GANs with neural networks, we have an efficient way to compute the gradient of this function phi that we're trying to solve the minimization problem over. And that's using something called the back propagation algorithm. Um, the main point is we, we have access to it and we can compute it efficiently. Um, and just a bit of notation, just recall that when I write the gradient of phi using this grad phi notation, I mean the vector of partial derivatives. So because it's x and y, it's, it's all the partial derivatives with respect to x and then all the partial derivatives with respect to y. And um, we can also write that more compactly in terms of what I'll call partial gradients. So you can rewrite all the x partial gradients as, as this notation here, and you can do all the y ones in this um, orange part here. Okay, so um, that's what GANs are, and math, math, that's what the problem is mathematically. Um, let's have a look at what you might try and do when you uh, want to train these. But before we do that, I just want to talk about um, some optimization preliminaries, or probably one of the most common, one of my favorite optimization algorithms. 
So first let's consider not this min-max problem that we're needing to solve, but let's just consider the case of trying to minimize a function f um, by uh, changing a vector x in Rn. Um, the gradient descent algorithm is one method which you can use to solve this problem. And what it does is it generates a sequence of vectors according to this equation here. Um, so you have xk, you have minus lambda, which is a step size parameter, or in machine learning, it's called the learning rate, multiplied by the gradient. And that's how I get my next point. Um, and then you iterate this procedure and you get, a, you get a sequence that way. Now this sequence converges to a solution of the problem um, under some assumptions. And it has some good intuition about what's happening as well. So if you think of this like um, a map and you're trying to get to the minimum point on the map in terms of the altitude, so the point of minimum altitude, um, what this gradient descent algorithm says is to get from where you currently are, which is xk to xk plus one, you take a step in the direction of negative of the gradient of length lambda. Right? So in other words, you go in the direction which is steepest of steepest descent from where you're standing to get to your next point, however long you can step. So this is a, a good method for minimization problems and um, it has some good intuition. Okay, let's go back to this problem of um, training a, a GAN, this min-max problem. Well, the first thing you might do or you might try to do is to use something that's called the saddle gradient method. Um, it looks like this. Um, so it's very close to gradient descent, probably you can see. Um, what we have here is because we're trying to minimize with respect to X, we do gradient descent with respect to the X variables, which is why we just have the partial X gradient there. And we're trying to maximize in Y. So we do gradient ascent. We do the opposite to maximize the function. So you do plus instead of minus. So you get two sequences, and this sounds like it should be a reasonable thing to do. Um, the problem is it doesn't converge even when you apply it to really simple problems. Um, but despite that, it's, it's still actually used often in practice, but it's a bit fiddly. You have to set everything up exactly right. You have to sometimes change the starting point and various other things. Um, but the theoretical foundations aren't there to justify it. Um, What's the intuition for this method? Well, it's, it's what I just said earlier, I guess, right? So you're doing gradient descent in one variable and you're doing ascent in the other variable. Um, okay, so I have, I think I will skip the next slide in the name of time, but let me just say that if you wanna look at a problem where this method fails to converge, you don't have to try very hard. Uh, you just take the function phi x of y to be, for two real numbers, x multiplied by y, and this method doesn't converge. And it's, it's just some linear algebra to check, but you don't have to try very hard. Okay, so now let's talk about how we can actually train one of these things. Um, and it turns out you just need a small modification of the saddle gradient method that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, here's the results of a theorem um, of mine with, with my collaborator, uh, Jura Malitsky, who's um, uh, at Linköping University in Sweden. Um, and what we could prove is that if you, instead of doing the saddle gradient method, you do this slight modification, then you get a solution to a min-max problem like the one up the top. And so to talk about what we're doing here, let's just have a look at the X variables. What we do is we have XK minus two times the steepest descent direction at the current point. And then we add on that gradient or that descent direction or negative that descent direction from the previous point. So we have a two here, which is different. And we have an extra term, which is involving the previous points in the sequence. Um, and then we do the same thing for Y, um, but all the signs are flipped around because we're trying to maximize instead of minimize. Um, and so this algorithm is good in the sense that um, you don't need any extra computation compared to the saddle gradient method. You have this extra term here, but it's always what you generated previously when you ran this algorithm. So it's something you've already computed. You just store it for one extra iteration and then you use it. The intuition for this method, there is a good answer, let me say, but it's a bit more difficult to explain um, in terms of, of how, how this makes sense. Um, but let me just say there is a good answer of, of how it is. Okay. 
So that's a method that has some theory to explain why it should converge. Let's now take uh, this and actually apply it in a problem or not work that I've done, but let's see what happens when you apply it in a problem and see if it makes a difference in the last sort of three minutes or so that we have. So we're gonna look at a computational example, which is from uh, this paper down the bottom, Training Guns with Optimism. And it's an example with the CIFAR10 data set. It's a data set with 60,000 32 by 32 pixel color images, which are in 10 classes. So you can see here's an example of those images. The classes are things like airplane is one class, automobile is one class, that's got all the pictures of cars, and so on and so on. Um, and the comparison now is between two methods. So the subtle gradient method, which we know can fail to converge, and then the method, which I showed you on the previous slide, which has some theory to back it up. Um, and so we're going to train a GAN to try and generate samples from this, um, this data set here. Um, and then we're going to compare the results of these two methods using something called the inception score. Um, roughly speaking, what this measures, it, it's, a, it's a metric to decide how good a GAN is, but it, it measures two things. Um, the first is that if your GAN generates an image and you look at that image, you should clearly be able to identify that it belongs to just a single class. So you should be able to clearly say that's an airplane and not a bottom end. Yeah. Um, so that's called saliency. And the second thing is diversity. And that just means if I get my GAN to generate a whole heap of different images, it doesn't give me just horses, say. It gives me a mixture of horses, dogs, frogs, and, and all the other classes and things like that. Okay, so what happens? Um, this is the inception score on the vertical axis. Higher is better. And across the horizontal axis is um, to do with number of passes over the, the full data set. So it's a measure of how long you've run the algorithm, let's say. And you can see that the saddle gradient method is not as good as, as our method there. Um, okay, let's see some pictures though, because that's, you know, that's what we're here to see. So on the left here, here's just um, a 10 by 10 grid of samples generated from the resulting bounds from these two methods. The subtle gradient is on the left, and then our method is on the right. And I think even without trying to look too closely at the images, you can sort of see that as a whole, this one on the left looks mostly blue. So maybe that's not really generating a good diversity of, of images there, whereas the one on the right looks already more diverse. And if you zoom in on some of those pictures, you can see they look more clearly like whatever animal or, or, or thing they're looking at as compared to the left. Okay, let me just finish up there. Um, but my summary is this. So training GANs can be fickle, but if you have algorithms with good mathematical foundations, it can help to give better results. But then more generally, um, I think that the best mathematical theory comes by looking at these interesting applications. And then conversely, um, these interesting applications and cutting edge applications motivate the need for new mathematical theory. So it's really a two way street. Um, Thanks for your attention, everyone. Um, if you want to know more, there's my contact details in my webpage below. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's all for us.